Roger Walsh, thank you very much for coming on the channel. Thank you. So I'd love to hear a little bit about uh, your background. I covered a lot of uh, different areas in my time. I was very fortunate, grew up in Australia, uh, <coughs> came over to the U United States on a Fulbright scholarship. Uh, was supposed to go back after a year or so, but rapidly fell in love with California and wasn't going anywhere. Uh, <coughs> had the good fortune of going to Stanford, doing my psychiatry training there. And uh, that was really an eye-opener. I had come from a very uh, conventional medical scientific background, had MD, a PhD. I thought I would end up back in neuroscience lab, but uh, being in psychiatry training and uh, being around people who were exploring the mind and doing their own, th having their own psychotherapy, and of course being in California, everything changed <laughs> in ways I could never have predicted. And uh, as almost an ethical imperative, uh, since I was doing psychotherapy on people, I felt I had an obligation to try some myself. I didn't really expect much, but boy was I wrong. I had the very good fortune of being in therapy with a man by the name of Jim Bugenthaler master humanistic existential therapist and he was exquisitely sensitive and able to help me get in touch with my own experience in a way I'd never been able to do before and I realized I'd been living my life from here up and <clears throat> I came to realize there was an inner universe as vast and mysterious as the outer which I had had no idea even existed and I was just blown away. I felt like I'd lived my entire life on the top six inches of a wave on top of an o inner ocean that I didn't even know existed. And I was stunned. I mean, how could I have been so out of touch, so unaware of uh, inner experience? And yet, as I looked around at the culture, it seemed like that was the way the culture was. Almost no one was really uh, in touch with their inner depths or aware of the potentials available to us. So then I started exploring multiple practices and traditions in California, of which there are many. So you name it, I did it, STA, <laughs> TM, I mean, we could run through a long list. And eventually I found myself gravitating towards uh, religious and spiritual traditions, and I had no idea why, because uh, I thought religion was the opiate of the masses. and. Yet I tried some meditation, it seemed helpful. I tried some yoga, it seemed helpful. I chanted, it all seemed helpful. And I couldn't understand why. <laughs> why did these relics of primitive thinking seem to be beneficial? And it took, a, it took a, a couple of years of really wrestling with it, but there was literally one moment as I was walking across the living room floor when I, 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 it hit me that behind the conventional institutions with their rituals and dogma were a much less well-known set of contemplative practices for training the mind to cultivate the same qualities and capacities that the great founders and saints and sages had realized and that they also were accompanied by contemplative philosophies and psychologies which explained how the world looked from those more developed perspectives and uh, how, how the mind functioned in normally, but also in very different altered states of consciousness and at post-conventional developmental stages. So this was just an eye-opener for me. And uh, the day after I got tenure, I applied for two years leave of absence to disappear into a monastery in Asia and did intensive meditation <laughs> practice. And uh, have been very fortunate of being able to merge the worlds of both traditional academia, psychiatry, psychology, with an exploration of contemplative practices, uh, po human possibilities, potentials, virtues, such as love and wisdom, and to see how the, if we can make sense of them. And also look across traditions. You know, this is the first time in history we've had all the world's traditions available to us to, to look for what are the common practices, what are the common ideas and themes, and possibilities they suggest about what a human being can be. Mm, it's fascinating. I, I'm curious because you've really seen, uh, I imagine, a lot of changes over that time in the way people even think about these traditions and these kind of techniques of wisdom, for want of a better word. Do you think it's easier now to bring that into the academic discussion or is it still a challenge or how, how do you find it? 
Well, I think both. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, you could get excommunicated for saying the word spirituality <laughs> a couple of, uh, maybe three decades ago. Now it's, uh, if not acceptable in all circles, at least it's an acceptable thing in some areas, such as psychology. And uh, in a growing number of uh, academics are themselves, although still a small minority, involved in contemplative practices, mindfulness particularly, yoga of course. So it's getting a little easier and it's also a little easier in as much as we're increasingly able to reframe and reconceptualize some of the traditional spiritual terms and make sense of them in terms of uh, contemporary ideas around psychology, mental function, etc. I think a lot of you, me, and a small but growing number of people in academia are functioning in what Carl Jung called a, a Gnostic intermediary. Mm. And he defined a Gnostic intermediary as someone who uh, immersed themselves in a wisdom tradition so deeply that they were able to communicate out of their direct experience to other mm. people. And as far as I can see, a Gnostic intermediary then uh, has three goes through three processes. First, they immerse themselves in the tradition to the point that they can really uh, have it as a, a deep part of their own experience and understand it. Then they have to learn the conceptual framework and system of the people they want to communicate to. And then they third, they have to translate so as to make the ideas from the wisdom tradition or religious tradition comprehensible in terms of the other person's framework. And I think a growing number of us are basically trying to do that, reframe what are in some ways archaic terms and concepts into conventional language and, and concepts, particularly psychology, but not only psychology. I'd love to take one of those concepts or words, wisdom, because I, I know you're, that's something you're looking at right now. Um, and of course, we're called rebel wisdom, so it's, it's, cl it's close to our hearts. Um, to you, what does, what does wisdom mean? What, well, I've wrestled for a long time trying to come up with a definition, and um, let me just give a little context in both in both West, Western in the Western tradition and in some Asian traditions, uh, for example, as in Buddhism. There's a common division between two types of wisdom. One is insight and understanding, and the other is practical know-how. And so I think I, I define wisdom as wisdom is deep insight and understanding of oneself and the central existential issues of life, meaning purpose, aloneness, mortality, suffering, death, plus practical skill in responding to these issues effectively and benevolently. And we can parse that out a little if you'd like. For example, uh, the wisdom is deep insight and understanding, insight both intuitive, direct seeing, and understanding, conceptual understanding of both oneself. And th that understanding can be at multiple levels, of course, from just seeing what particular habits I have, and oh, that's not so smart, um, to seeing some of the dynamics of the mind, to seeing very deeply into the deeper nature of ourself, so-called transcendent wisdom, or what in India would call prajna or jnana, that direct seeing into what can be interpreted as pure consciousness, being, God, different names. So those are the deep, that's the deep insight and understanding of oneself, and then also deep insight and understanding of the central existential issues of life. The issues that all of us have to face and wrestle with simply because we're human and come with a body which is going to sicken and age and die. And we are challenged with how to relate as skillfully as we can to others, how to deal with the inevitable issues that life presents us with. So those are, the, those are existential issues. They're part of existence. They're not just circumstantial. They're existential. They come with being in a body. So deep insight and understanding of both oneself and the central existential issues of life, plus practical skill in being able to respond effectively, that is, skillfully, effectively to handle situations and benevolently, because there's agreement across multiple traditions that wisdom is intimately linked with benevolence. Mm. It's not just 
if, if a person is acting out of mere self-interest, that's not enough. Benevolence, altruism seem to be inextricably linked with wisdom. And in fact, uh, wisdom confers a profound, a radical understanding of virtues because from the perspective of the wise, the virtues are simply the ways of living that make sense. If a person who sees deeply into themselves recognizing, recognizes their deep transpersonal nature and recognizes it in others, of course they want to be ethical. That person deserves no less than that. Of course they want to be benevolent. The person deserves no less than that. But we deserve no less than that ourselves. So uh, that gives a whole different understanding of virtues. And so when I think when a lot of people look out the window, uh, they see, or you know, lots of us see a very tribalized, very um, chaotic political and cultural landscape. Do you think there's any relationship between wisdom and, or maybe lack of wisdom, <laughs> and that? Well, sure. Um, I think the, there's no question that most of us are living way below our potential. And when you ask a group of people, for example, in a talk, or Perhaps if you asked your audience, where on the average uh, is humankind in its journey from infancy to adult, through childhood, through adolescence, through maturity, through, through old age? Most people will say adolescence. And I think that speaks to uh, a, an intuitive insight on the part of the majority of people that we are not functioning at our best. That, and it's becoming clearer and clearer from both adult developmental psychology, which is a remarkably important field, which is, I think, one of the most exciting discoveries of psychology in the last few decades, that what we took to be normality is not the ceiling of human possibilities. There are stages of development which people are now beginning to map out through post-conventional and even trans-conventional stages. Yet, if the, the, yet the, only a small percentage of the people are operating at those levels, and who knows what possibilities there are beyond that. So if most people are operating way below their potential, with, as Abraham Maslow, the great humanistic psychologist, said, you know, what we call normality is really a form of, form of collective pathology. And I would frame it as what we call normality is a form of collective developmental arrest. And once you see that, then you can see that, yeah, it's not surprising that we have so many social and global problems, not to mention the fact, of course, that, <clears throat> that we're dealing with entirely new eras and levels of complexity and innovation and change and so forth. We don't have guidelines. We're kind of thrown into this and trying to make our way. So we have a desperate need for fostering psychological maturation, for fostering deep insight and understanding, wisdom, and other virtues. So as someone who's really delved into many different traditions and written very well about many of them as well, where would you suggest someone begin if they want to start tapping into their potential more fully and, and kind of, let's say, gaining more wisdom? Well, I think it obvi obviously it depends on the individual, and so it's a little hard to hard to make general recommendations, but we can cover a variety of, spe of, of possibilities. First of all, uh, you know, I spent three years writing this book, Essential Spirituality and Seven Central Practices, and three years studying the different traditions and what they say about cultivating different virtues and capacities, including wisdom. And you know what surprised me most was that every single tradition said that for every single virtue, if you want to develop this virtue in yourself, hang out with people who have it. You know, consciousness is catchy. <laughs> and the, what, the theme that has been recognized for millennia in these traditions is that we re, we're like tuning forks. We re resonate with one another. And when we're around wiser, more altruistic, more ethical people, we're pulled in that direction ourselves. You know, parents know this. They want their kids to hang out with the right kids. I mean, this is not revolutionary, except we don't apply it to ourselves. So first thing, relationships. Look for people who can be, who can be mentors and teachers and friends who can 
support us in our, in our learning and growth. Second, recognize that there are further potentials and possibilities available to us. And that in itself is inspiring. Uh, <clears throat> third, look for a particular kind of practice you feel drawn to. We are blessed in the West at this time with an unprecedented opportunity for an enormous variety of practices we can do. So what is it that appeals to you? Uh, are you drawn to meditation, to yoga, to uh, using your work in the world as a form of service? Are you drawn to uh, exploring in groups, men's groups, women's groups, psychotherapy groups, whatever? Uh, community, very, very important. Nature, every tradition recommends nature as a source of healing and inspiration and uh, opening to uh, resonance with the larger world and, and our role in it. So time in nature. Uh, solitude, periods of solitude, just having the time to sit and, and reflect and reflecting with the aid of tools like journaling, taking, ref, using a journal as a way of reflect, reflecting. Uh, so those are some of the possibilities. There are more, but there, there are lots. And I think well, each of us has to feel into what draws us. And it may be appropriate to say a little bit about the, the development uh, that people go through as they begin exploring growth practices, mm -hmm. because um, initially, it may be totally appropriate to do a uh, to do adopt a smorgasbord approach. You know, try a little of this uh, Tuesday. I'll try that uh, Sunday. Maybe I'll go to church. You know, <laughs> and that's fine. But see what feels good. And at some stage, you may feel drawn, and may be perfectly appropriate to dive very deeply into one practice or one tradition. And uh, that can be very valuable to focus, to really immerse oneself, and to uh, dedicate oneself to a particular practice. And then again, at some future stage, you may feel you're getting a little stale and would benefit from exposure to something else. So, so there's a rhythm to psychological work and spiritual growth. And we each have to tune in and trust our own intuitive feelings about this. I'm curious as well about how, how that might look uh, on the more collective level when we come together, because this is something we're, we're very interested in. Um, a lot of our events, we, uh, you know, we might bring up a cultural issue, but then encourage people to um, enter into an inquiry around that. And then maybe not from a kind of place of telling a story or here's my opinion, but really a kind of an inquiry, like a talking meditation almost into thinking, okay, w what does this really bring up for me? And th thinking at a deeper level. So I'm very curious about what, what some of the traditions have said or your experience in the best ways for us to come together in that way. What we used to do all the time in church, but we don't really do anymore. Yes, and there's significant research, of course, showing that uh, communities, groups, interpersonal contact has gone down dramatically since, particularly since screen time increased so much. So I think this is one of the issues of our time, how, how we can foster community, and particularly how we can foster communities that, that serve both our individual and collective uh, healing and growth in various ways. And I think, um, I know you're exploring various uh, possibilities, and, and I think a number of people are. I think, I think this is a kind of cutting edge work. So uh, again, it feels like, uh, you know, what particular approach are we drawn to? Some people are drawn to, again, to more contemplative inquiry together, kind of uh, one extreme would be the Quaker movement where there's a lot of emphasis on silence, listening, and then speaking from the spirit in the, when called. Another is uh, at the other extremes, a more active inquiries, dialogue, even uh, in some traditions, debate, challenging debate. Uh, Tibetan Buddhism, Judaism, for example, they really go at it as a way of trying to, trying to carve away faulty presuppositions, which are much harder to see in ourselves than in others. And, and so even that kind of very active debate, if done for the purpose, and here's the crucial thing, what's the purpose of these things? Mm -hmm. Is the purpose 
what was traditionally called heuristic, where I'm trying to prove my point, or is it more Socratic, a, a shared inquiry for truth, which may uh, probably eludes us both, but together perhaps we get a little closer. So one of the kind of hot topics in our culture right now is the relationship between men and women. Um, uh, probably a relationship as old as time, but it certainly seems now, you know, we've referred to it as it looks very much like a dysfunctional relationship in the culture. Um, and many people are looking at, you know, how, how do we kind of heal that relationship? Um, as a psychiatrist, uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I have a lot of thoughts, but so do a lot of, <laughs> a lot of other people. Uh, yes, it is a very challenging time, and it's reflective of the larger social situation, the larger global situation of so much dramatic change, so much uh, immersion, immersion from out of conventional roles and rules where things were simply circumscribed, and pre pro prescribed and proscribed. And so people had very clear directions. There wasn't such a demand for, uh, for autonomy, for uh, finding one's own role, and at the same time, we have the social structures, including power structures, being called into question, broken up, and in some ways very healthy. We have the Me Too movement, people, women now able to speak out about things they didn't feel safe speaking out before, and that's all to the good. And at the same time, uh, the, we have the diversity movement, so, so there's there's just an enormous amount going on, and everyone, of course, or, most people are feeling, understandably, somewhat uh, confused. For example, there's a role confusion. What is, what is a, a skillful role as a man or a woman in this culture or in some other gender division? Uh, what are the appropriate and skillful ways of relating? I mean, we're still we're trying to find... <laughs> work, find those out for ourselves. And um, of course, this is all in some ways for the good if we see it as a developmental or evolutionary process in which we're coming out of a rigid, conventional structures and moving into a, at least hopefully, a post-conventional, more open, more fluid, more wider range of possibilities that's very good, but it does lead through a period of disorientation. So holding that developmental and evolutionary perspective, I think, is helpful. Uh, there are also some problems, you know. Well, uh, social movements inevitably go to extremes and have counter-reactions and backlashes. You know, the philosopher Hegel certainly had it right that <laughs> each, th each thesis leads to its antithesis. And, and another way of putting it, each, each for, uh, as the philosopher Habermas said, there's the dialectic of progress. Every new developmental phase or evolutionary phase solves some problems, but it opens new ones. So we're seeing benefits, but we're also seeing the opening of new problems. And to list some of them, um, you know, there's, a, there's now a hypersensitivity among men and women about what can, what, particularly men, what can I say, how can I re relate, can I be this close, can I touch, I mean, it's, you know, maybe healthy, but also very, very difficult and prob problematic. There's also, um, you know, some misuse of data, for example, the, uh, in this country, you know, it's commonly thrown around as an accusation against, uh, quotes patriarchy, and women still only earn 85 cents on the dollar for a man. Well, yes, but when you look more closely, for equal jo same jobs and equal hours, it's 98 cents on the dollar, and one survey it was 103. So, we, so the assumption that this is due to patriarchal bias may not hold, it may be Certainly one problem is the lack of adequate child care in this country, which is abysmal and penalizes women enormously. So one problem that comes up is an assumption, if there's any inequality, that it's a reflection of, reflection of bias. And actually, if we look at things in a larger, more systemic way, then 
Um, there may be some bias, but there are other factors as well. And, you know, at bottom, it comes down to how do we treat each other as fairly and honestly and carefully as we possibly can. It's an ongoing challenge for all of us. Mm. And part of the... Um, so recently, the American Psychological Association uh, released their guidelines on for working with men, and it created quite a storm. Um, mm. And I'm curious about your perspective on that, and also what, what to you a healthy masculinity looks like. Well, that's a great question. <laughs> what does a healthy masculinity, <coughs> masculinity look like? Um, well, I think it looks, <laughs> I, I, in my mind, I'm immediately trying to differentiate how does that, how does the masculine side differentiate or add to uh, the idea of psychological health? And how does, how does it flavor? So uh, I suspect, you know, how does, the answer is, what is psychological health, which is something we don't have clear ideas about. You know, psychology, psychiatry know a lot about pathology. They don't know all that much about psychological health and well-being, and, which is why it's such a fascinating area. But I think uh, certainly we can say that psychological health and well-being consist of uh, several things. They comprise a maturity. So now that we know about post-conventional developmental stages, you know, clearly psychological health involves maturing through at least early post-conventional stages. Secondly, it involves uh, insight, uh, self-insight and understanding of one of the central elements of wisdom. So that's clearly core. Uh, third, it involves self, deep self-acceptance, recognition of our humanity, our inevitable failures and foibles, uh, our inevitable neuroses, uh, so Carl Jung said that self-acceptance was the acid test of one's humanity. So clearly that. Um, clearly it involves a, a willingness and capacity for accepting feedback, which is crucial for any relation relationship, the willingness to accept hopefully helpful criticism, to, <clears throat> to look at one's shortcomings and failings. Um, so there are we could go on, I mean, I think there are a whole, we could track a variety of capacities and virtues and say that a healthy person embodies these, and then a healthy masculinity. Um, again, it will vary from, between, from individual to individual, and so a healthy masculinity, I think, will involve fostering one's own uh, fostering one's well-being and wisdom and capacities as fully as possible and feeling into how most sensitively and appropriately and skillfully and joyfully to express those in relationship with everyone, including women. Rebel Wisdom is a new sense-making platform, bringing together the most rebellious and inspiring thinkers from around the world. If you're enjoying our content, then you can help us make more by becoming a subscriber, which will give you access to a load of exclusive films. Also, you can then join our group Zoom calls to discuss the ideas in the films, and you can send us ideas for questions for upcoming interviews. We're also looking for talented people to help us out with editing, graphics, music, that kind of thing. And if you're a regular viewer, you'll know we talk a lot about the value of embodying or actually living out the ideas that we talk about. That's why we run regular events in London. Check out the links on the website for more. And hope to see you soon.